Kings and Queens, welcome to another episode of A New Perspective with us, LTC, Talal, Mike, myself. We're joined here today by a special guest, David Edwards, and he's going to talk about his 10 foundations of motivation, as well as a couple other things, kind of how he came about those, and we're just going to take it from the top. David, how are you? Hi, great. Thank you. Nice to meet everybody. It's nice to meet you, too. Thank you so much for taking time out of day. I know you you know, you must, you're a busy guy. So, and we also appreciate you being on our episode as our special guest. Um, I'm really excited to hear what you have to say. Um, when Nate kind of pitched us what, what you, you wanted to talk about, we were all immediately interested. So I'm glad to have you on. Fantastic. Should we just dive in? Yeah, yeah. might as well. Uh, if you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, a little bit about your background, yeah. um, we can go from there. So I worked in healthcare uh, for the last 35 years, uh, mostly for smaller organizations um, and mostly community health centers or federally qualified health centers. These are centers that were set up starting in the 60s, um, you know, with two sites, one in the deep south and one in the deep east. And um, as a, a social experiment, and they've grown and expanded over the decades. And today, I think there are over like 1,400 of them all over the country. Uh, every state, almost every county has a branch of a community health center in it. Uh, they typically serve more vulnerable populations, right? So lower income, a lot of times minorities, um, people with special challenges like the homeless. Um, but they vary, you know, are on a range like that across the country. So, and I'm going to fast forward to 35 years of working, but I've been privileged to work in Africa, in Nigeria, to work in Alaska with a tribal consortium of Native American governments who uh, are Alaska Native governments um, who had combined their healthcare power and budgets to create a single entity to serve all of Southeast Alaska, um, to working most recently in Oregon, in a rural area, a lot of agriculture, lots of cherries and cherry trees and orchards and orchardists. And I had the privilege of working with um, migrant and seasonal farm workers uh, and orchardists and hospital administrators and public health and all kinds of different people. Um, while I was there, we had the opportunity to replace our oldest health center. Our facility, you know, we've outgrown it. I mean, my office was upstairs in what used to be a storage room and this, the heating, ventilating, air conditioning room was now the storage room. <laughs> the IT was in a closet. We had staff in closets um, that was, you know, we just totally outgrown um, and we desperately needed, you know, something. And we, after a few years had been successful enough, I guess that we could actually rebuild and do something from scratch. And we had built a powerful clinical model, very different from what we normally think of. So the historical you know, model was if Talal, if you're the doctor and I'm the patient, I would come to see you, uh, fit into your schedule and be privileged you know, to get in to see you for five minutes. You would talk to me, poke and prod me a little bit. Then you'd pat me on this head and say, David, go do this. And if you do it, you're a good patient. And I'd go on my way and hopefully, you know, follow what you told me to do. And that was the typical doctor-patient relationship. And that's a little snide, but I mean, you know, that isn't, that isn't that unfair though at the same time. And so we had built a model where if I was the patient, and let's say, I love this, so there's three of you here, and then your audience, we can play along, we'll do a role play. And so each of you is a team member and you each have a different role. So I know this isn't what you do, but we'll say Talal is a doctor and Nate is a dentist and Mike, you're a therapist. And a couple of audience members, right? You could be a community health worker, a health coach, a behavioral health consultant, um, a trainer, uh, we had lots of different roles. And the idea was, if I'm the patient, 
I am the captain of the care team. I'm sorry, Talal, you would like to be, and you're used to being it, but in this day and age, it doesn't work, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm the captain. I know myself better than anybody else, right? I live with myself 24-7. I see you guys once a month, once a quarter, once a year, maybe, right? And so you can only have so much influence over me. So I have to be the captain of the team. And then we talk and we do a little negotiating and, and we figure out a care plan that helps me with my needs. But then I'm responsible, right? The rest of my life, the rest of the time in between seeing one of you to carry it out and to be successful or not. And so as the captain um, or as the CEO of this you know, kind of model that we had built, um, I realized after 35 years, that it all hinges on me and my ability or my capability to play the role, right? How successful can I be as the captain of this team? And what are the skill sets that are required to do it? Because we were investing, I think, $16 million in a new building. And we were doing all kinds of cool biophilic design. If there's any architects out there or whatever, you know, we were looking at all the latest and greatest technologies, um, the best staff, you know, the best team, the best um, kind of scope of services, all these things. And I realized it was going to be at not if we didn't focus more on the, this one thing. And so I started studying change models. So in psychology, and I had all these wonderful, you know, people with psychology backgrounds I was working with. Um, there are various change models because change is essential. And there's two kinds of change. And I think this is important for us to think about. So the one kind of change is kind of a change that's going on around us, right? So Russia invades Ukraine, those awful leaders in Russia that just has me distraught sometimes just to think about it but anyways so stuff happens right technology changes when I was newly married 36 years ago um, um, we bought our first VCR you guys are younger guys I think Oh, we um, still know VCRs. Yeah, no, we, yeah. we, yeah, we know what VCRs are. I'm, 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 VCR is, yeah. I'm very, yeah. very fond of the old VCR yeah. that we used to have. <laughs> I still right. have a working one that's plugged in. Well, oh, there you go. Yeah. So then we had our first VCR. Now, back in those days, a nice forehead <laughs> VCR was like $400. We saved for like a year to buy this stupid VCR at the outlet center, at Sears, in fact, which doesn't even exist anymore. So I was very proud because I knew how to program the VCR. And on Tuesday evening at five o'clock, since I wasn't gonna be home yet, I could record you know, a TV show that we wanted to watch later. And you could zoom kind of through commercials even, you know, it was awesome. But today, knowing how to use a VCR is virtually like being a dinosaur. Nobody cares. It's not that useful, right? So then we learned to use DVD players and then Blu-ray players. And now almost all of us stream, right? So we have to know how to stream and where to find what we want to watch and which service it is and whatnot. So technology and stuff just changes all around us. And so we got to keep up with that kind of change. Otherwise, we find ourselves becoming less relevant, frankly, and I think more important, less capable of being in charge of our lives. And so keeping up with that change is important. It's not a trivial thing, it's important. The other kind of change, which I think as important as the outside stuff is, is frankly even more important, is the change that we initiate ourselves, right? The change in who we are, and what we are becoming, because whatever we're thinking about, or unfortunately, so often it happens, we're not thinking about, we are changing. And whether we're in charge of how we're changing or not, or we're allowing our friends, our family, our girlfriend or boyfriend, our social media, our, um, you know, the marketing companies, right? We see 3,000 images every day, which just kind of blows my mind when I found that research. 
And so all of these images are messages and they're trying to influence us in some way. So am I, am I in charge of that? Or I just like go with the flow and I do whatever, you know, I think in the moment, right? I just allow whim and fancy and emotion to drive me as I float around in life. And that's not healthy either, frankly, right? So we want to be in charge, kind of like this care team. We want to be the captain of how we are changing the direction that we're changing so that we're not just drifting with however society is and marketers are drifting. Does that make sense so far? Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So, so I was doing all this reading. I was researching change models. And this really was my big epiphany, my big wow moment. It was at the core, the foundation, if you will, of every change model, no matter which one I found or looked at, was this idea of intrinsic or personal motivation. Now we think of motivation, right? And oftentimes we might think of you know, Tony Robbins or you know, some big motivational speaker or in, in the day before, you know, it was like Zig Ziglar or Brian Tracy who was actually still around doing his thing. And, and there's nothing wrong with these things, right? But they're running around, they're jumping up and down and they're all excited and they're trying to get us you know, excited and we use the word motivated, right? It's like getting a bonus at work or getting a grade at school, right? So we're motivated by these external things. But the kind of motivation I'm talking about is intensely personal. And it's unique and different for each person who are all three of you young fellows, the young lads, I like that on your website. Um, and, I, and for everybody who's listening, right? It's intensely personal to us. And so it can't be generated by a rah-rah speech. And so what I started to do was in fact study, well, what, what, how do we get that, right? How do we find this? How do we elevate this so that we can in fact, not only be the captain of our care team, but we can be the captain of our own lives. And I got fired <laughs> from my job. I didn't steal or anything nefarious like that. It would be a better story in some ways, but uh, I had a disagreement with my board and I lost the argument. Uh, and, uh, and so I found myself with time on my hands and I started to deep dive on these principles. And then I'm gonna kind of fast forward. I started a little business just before the pandemic for lots of reasons, it didn't work out. Um, and I, I had done so much reading and writing and thinking though and I'd created these affirmations. Have you guys ever heard of an affirmation? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it's a positive in present tense, you know, kind of a statement of intent, if you will. Um, and, and so I created these affirmations and I started to organize them by themes. And I hadn't, until I, I, my, I kind of wrote the business off and I said, that isn't going to work right now. Um, so what am I going to do, right? Um, and I had the idea that I should write a book. And I started organizing these things. And I realized there were themes that I'd not really recognized before. And as I went through and started, you know, just kind of how you do that, you start organizing and categorizing. And, and I realized there were really 10 themes. And I went back to the research. And I said, is this me dreaming? Or is there something valid to this? And I had it validated to me at least that, yeah, these were in fact principles. And I came up with 10 of them that are timeless. They're enduring, right? Greek philosophers were writing about them 3000 years ago and they're just as valid today and they'll be just invalid 3000 years from now. Just like if I wanna fly a plane, I have to stand understand natural principles like the Bernoulli principle and how lift happens and how gravity works and you know how we can overcome gravity you have to know those things if you want to have success right in flying for example or in not jumping off the cliff because you think it would be all right um, and so just like that in life there are principles that determine how human beings work 
and they've been around forever and they will be around forever. And there will be tips and tricks and hacks and things all around these principles, which is fine. But what I find is that many times we spend so much time on the tips and tricks and the hacks that we fail to build the foundations first, mm -hmm. which are gonna help those things to actually accomplish what we want to accomplish. And the way that I've come to understand that, and that seems to resonate well with folks when I'm talking to them, is a, nat a natural metaphor. I'm trying to move personally, and I'd love to help move society a little bit beyond a mechanical metaphor. When I say a mechanical metaphor, does that mean anything? What does that mean to you guys? If, you know, does that mean anything? Or what do you think that, what, I'm, what am I talking about? You can say I don't know, or I, you have I, an idea. I can't, one or the other. I can't put I can't put my finger on what a mechanical metaphor would be. Okay, so this is what's happened, and we don't even think about it. And I love there's a book um, Peter Senge from MIT talked about this years and twenty years ago probably, but he said we had what we commonly refer to as the industrial revolution. You guys have all heard of the industrial revolution? Yes. yes. Yeah, so maybe about roughly, I'm not a historian, but let's say about 300 years ago, right? We started saying, wow, a steam engine. This is cool, right? It's effective. And we kind of morphed forward from there, right? And then we had cars and then we had planes and then we had toasters and you know microwaves and computers. And, and we've evolved to this point where we don't even think about it anymore. But if you look at the metaphors that we use to describe, so I was looking at like job descriptions, for example. If you're looking at a job as a CEO, um, since I've been a CEO or a CFO for most of the last 30 years, um, it will often say something like drive change, right? Or make things happen, yeah. right? And, and I'm a fan of Stephen Covey, if anybody's ever heard of Stephen Covey anymore. But uh, yeah, I love how he talks about, he says, you drive your car, but if you try to drive your teenager, good luck with that, right? Or drive your wife, right? Hi, wife, if you do what I want you to do and you get me from here to there, then you're a good wife and we pat you on the head and say, congratulations. You know, if we try to do that, then you aren't going to have a wife for very long or a husband for very long or a friend for very long or a neighbor or anybody else, because that's not how we work with people, right? With people, we use words like lead, support, nurture. Um, we use different words than we do with machines. But mentally, we have a hard time separating things, right, machines from people. And so companies today, it's very common. We talk about people are our greatest asset. Well, I have an MBA, and in business school, I was taught that once you've bought an asset, it's yours to do with what you please. You can keep it. You can build on it. You can sell it. You can destroy it. You can do whatever you want because it's an asset. It only exists to help you move forward with your business purposes, right? It's, it's, uh, it's not compassionate, you know, and there's no use in getting attached to it because it's an asset and its only purpose is to help you move your business forward. So when we talk about people as assets, right? We talk about this machine metaphor and we don't even think about it, but people, I promise you are not assets. People Absolutely. are human beings. Absolutely. <laughs> and so I think we need to be rethinking this and we need to think about, as they say, fish are the last to discover water because it's always been there. It's all around them. They don't even think about it. It's just there. And this mechanical metaphor is just there. I feel like I'm on my soapbox here. No, but, that uh, was really good. No, that was, yeah, no, fish I, I are don't the know. last to discover yeah. water. Wow. And so I didn't invent that. So somebody else said that, but I mean, but, but it's, it's a beautiful that. metaphor. That's amazing. That's, That's amazing. a really it's, good It's one. kind of like, not, not exactly, but it's kind of like, you know, how, you know, uh, we don't pay attention to ants, basically. You know, they're there. We don't pay attention to all the little functions they do to support their lives and their ecosystem and everything like that. You know, kind of something similar. Yeah. Kind of like that. Yeah. And building, and especially like this day and age where we depend on technology so much, 
that it's like it's almost taken over some of the emotions that we used to have because now we kind of just see people like for example like corporate so see they just they don't really see people as people they see people as like like stuff doing tests that's it it's it's not really it's assets like, that's exactly assets. it's not like a yeah. human being they're just like oh exactly we just want this person to get the job done that's what they're fo- they're focused on the job they're not focusing on the human which is it's kind of sad to see nowadays um and i feel like that changed a lot especially in like the past 20 to 30 years it changed drastically um things were a lot different say in like the 70s 80s even 90s but now with this like technological boom that we're going through right now where like not even we can keep up with ourselves at this point yeah um we kind of struggle to see the value of human beings uh yeah. so yeah like we've never been more connected and disconnected at the same time and i feel like i feel like the 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 reason for change in the last 30 i, I would go as far as to say 40 50 years is because i think in that time is when these massive corporate entities have just come up out of nowhere before i feel like a lot of a lot of employers even if they had a lot of employees the employers were almost always on the job site connecting with employees but now because corporate businesses are so massive i mean i could i could work for a company across the planet and never ever know that i exist yeah, not as an individual Ex- yeah exactly but as a number i'm a st- i when when it's in that situation you're a statistic instead yeah. of a instead of a person yeah Absolutely. so there's a bonus idea for the podcast you know is this idea and you know this again a part of this um and, and well i'll get into this in a second i guess so and this would be a fun discussion and I don't mind having it, frankly, but, but so if we start to th- think of ourselves as people, as individuals, unique, and at the same time, not that unique, right? I love that what you said, that said, never more connected, but less connected at the same time, right? I, I love that idea. I think it really represents a lot of what we see in our society. And, and so let me think a second. So I'm going to move, if I could, into this natural metaphor, and I'll start to talk about this idea. So in nature, just like with human beings, because we're a part of nature, right, we're intrinsically connected to nature, not like a cyborg, that's the technology side, the technology side says we're all machines, you know, so we're going to attach components and parts. That's like tips, tricks, and hacks, techniques. I, that's what I kind of call them. We attach them on. And who, we hope to have, have a good result, right? It's an ABC tip, and I attach it on here, and I expect a certain outcome based upon that, a certain result. And if I don't get it, then I'm disappointed, right? I'm frustrated. I might disattach the thing, throw it away, and I'd try something different, right? So this is this mechanical metaphor again. So what I'm talking about is this natural metaphor. This is we are natural and just how our body functions and we're in inseparably connected with nature all around us. And so the um, I like the metaphor of a cherry tree. So most recently I worked in a rural area, lots of cherry trees and fruit trees. And, um, and so in nature, like a cherry tree, things start small. And you guys might have heard, so like there's some very popular books right now. They talk about making tiny incremental changes, right? And you get better over a period of time. So that's how nature works, right? So I think that's a very valid idea, very valid principle, if you will. So the first thing a seed does when it goes in the ground is it germinates, or eventually it germinates, right? And the first thing that happens then is it starts to put out roots, starts out really small, but those roots then start to grow amazingly rapidly, but in very small, ready, steady steps. And then once it's got enough roots, it goes up to the top and it starts to grow a stem. Now in a cherry tree, right, we call it a trunk, but it starts out very small. But the roots and the trunk then start growing proportionally. You don't get the huge big root ball and no trunk, right? And you don't get a huge big trunk with no root ball if you do something's wrong right it is out of balance 
And so typically in a healthy tree, they grow proportionally, they grow consistently together. And eventually over time, you get enough roots and enough capacity to gather moisture and gather nutrients and enough trunk to support branches and leaves and eventually fruit, right? That you, the tree starts to bear fruit. Most of our mechanical metaphor bolted on things are all about getting more fruit, right? We're always looking for better results. We want more outcome, more results, more fruit, bigger, bigger top of the tree. That's what we're focused on. That's what we want. And yet in nature, if you build all that stuff up without the foundations, right, of the trunk and the roots, in nature what happens is you have a big rainfall and there's not enough root structure to support what's on top and the tree fails catastrophically. Or you have a drought and because there's not enough roots to reach out far enough and draw what little moisture is, the tree actually fails catastrophically as a result. Or maybe you have a late summer or spring and so it's too cold for too long and again, the tree fails catastrophically. These aren't little failures. But in every one of those instances, if you have the big, strong, vibrant, thriving roots and trunk, the top might change based upon conditions, but the core remains strong and that tree is viable. And it's still there the next year, maybe when conditions are better. And we see this kind of history in things like tree rings, right? Big tree rings means it was a good year. Tiny, tiny little tree rings means it was a bad year. But if the overall core of the tree is healthy, it's viable, then it's going to have all those different rings. It isn't just going to die and fail. In our human existence, we see this in things like depression, anxiety, resignations, discouragement. We have all of these kinds of things. You know, we have in the business language, we talk about the great resignation. People are disengaged at work. We see all of these symptoms, right? But they're symptoms of a root cause. Part of that root cause is this overall thing we don't even think about, this mechanical metaphor versus a natural one. But part of that is that we are so used to building on all this stuff to get more harvest that we fail to tend to our internal foundations. And so we have these failures, these catastrophic failures sometimes, like a nervous breakdown, or we just you know, cease to function effectively. We can't get along with people. I mean, and there's so many ways that these things manifest, but they're virtually all, or the vast majority of them, are simply symptoms of this internal challenge or problem that we have. And so through all of this realization and this work that I'd done, I thought I could write a book and I think I could help some people and I could make a, a more difference in the world. And so I spent last year writing the book and really putting kind of pen to paper and organizing in, into these 10 principles some segments of information. So each chapter is a principle. There's 10 chapters. And then within each chapter, there are these segments. And think of them as ideas. Maybe there's some tips and tricks and techniques even in there. But they're all built on the foundation of this organizing principle. And the idea is that everybody is in a different place. You know, I don't know you guys very well, and you don't know me, and you have an audience of people, and we're all in a different place, right? We have different circumstances, maybe different beliefs. We were raised a little bit differently. But since these principles apply across all cultures, all beliefs, to engage with them, you don't have to have a certain amount of education. It doesn't matter how much money you make. It doesn't matter what your race or color is, what your background experience is, the trauma that you've had in your life. Um, it does, none of those external things matter because you can engage with the principles because they're timeless and they're simply a part of how we are built and how we function and operate as human beings as a part of nature. And so I try to put enough ideas in the segments that no matter who you are, there's something in there. And I think the worst thing a person could do 
and I talk about this later on in the book, um, some of us are like perfectionists. Everything has to be perfect. And so I want to get chapter one and I want to go through every single segment in there and adapt every one of them in my life, right? Oh my gosh, you know, we're ignoring that principle of everything to start small in nature, right? So it's a foundational overarching theme. So what I really encourage somebody to do is read through and I offer a process that I think makes sense. Um, if you don't like it, fine, adapt it, use something else, right? Make it work for you, but find something in the chapter that resonates with you because that is going to start to uncover your own personal motivation, right? Motivation is personal. It's unique. It's individual. And so it has to be something that you kind of connect with. And then don't worry about the other things. There might be three other good things in that chapter. I hope there are. But for you, take that one thing. And then as you go through the other segments or the other chapters, you'll have a process of, okay, then I'm going to work on that and make that a part of my life, not as a bolt-on, but as, as building my foundations, my roots and my trunk, so that whatever else is going on around me in the world, I am stronger. And in human terms, we use words like resilient. I love the verb. We never see the verb anymore. So I want to encourage you guys, let's promote the verb, because resilient is an adjective, right? It describes you as a noun, as a person. The verb though the action form of it right because we always want to be in that action form we want to be doing things not just describing things right because as we become we are in action when we're just describing things that's kind of a passive so we want to be active so we use the verb which is resile right so we learn to resile that is the nature of being resilient we learn to persevere the difference is we resile through short-term problems. Like I got fired. For me, that was challenging. <laughs> I knew about being fired. I'd actually fired some people in the past. But when you fired yourself, it becomes very personal. <laughs> and, and you have all these emotions and things that are going around. And in my research, for example, I found that 50,000 people in the United States alone are fired or laid off every single day. Just understanding that helped me think, well, I'm not alone, right? Because when we're going through a hard time, we very often start to cut off the rest of the world like it didn't even exist and say, I'm all alone. You know, I'm, I'm having trouble with my boyfriend or girlfriend, or I got a bad grade or, you know, whatever it happens to be. I had a bad performance review at work. I'm all alone. And we kind of, we shrink inside ourselves. And chapter nine of my book, so the ninth principle, is about our common humanity. And so often, even with the most unique circumstances, you can have a rare disease. One in 50,000 people is affected by this disease, or one in 100,000 people. But there are 8 billion people on the planet. So if you do the math, and my math isn't that good, but you would find there are thousands in the most unique circumstance there are thousands of people who are sharing that circumstance with you. You are not alone. We have our common humanity. And if we're able to reach out and connect with those, some of those people, right, we can then get over that kind of loneliness. And I'm all by myself, that feeling that we have. And that's, you know, one of the 10 principles. Uh, actually, so like, first off, I really like that point that you just brought up. Um, and going off of that one principle, and for people or like listeners that are curious about the other principles, where can one find your book or how can they contact you in order to like read the rest of what you, you just talked about? There you go. Um, so my name is David Edwards. Um, there are a lot of David Edwards around. <laughs> if you Google David R. Edwards, you come up with the first like two pages on Google as a lead singer who died last year. It was very tragic, too young, um, of a progressive rock group from Ireland <laughs> that I had never even heard of. But so, um, but if you type in www.davidredwards.com, 
you should come up with my website. I should be on the first page at least. Perfect, um, yeah. And that's the best way to get a hold of me. Um, I talk about my book a little bit. I have a, a video and I try to blog, not every week, because you know, who can keep up with that? You guys are better than me. I know you guys do this every week, but uh, I try to do a blog every couple of weeks. Um, and I have a number of blogs, the very first principle in the book, which is so powerful. And I'm you, if you go to my website and you sign up for my newsletter, I don't scam or sell or any of that garbage. Um, you'll get a white paper or a report, if you will, on values that I think is super helpful. Um, and that's the way to get hold of me. That's the best way. DavidREdwards.com. Perfect. I, I think um, one ahead. thing too, um, kind of going off towards the end of that conversation. Um, one thing I really admire is, you know, you, you're very open to admitting, you know, everything is very subjective to you. And that that's one thing I, I tried to do with the, my book. That's one thing we try to encourage in our podcast episodes. You know, you can take everything we say, but take it with a grain of salt, you know, it, apply it to yourself. And because everybody's different, there's no way to capture everything into one, uh, I guess, requirement you know you you can't fit this little box and then this will work perfectly for you you know take everything with a grain of salt and apply it to yourself so i really do like that you know you you did it that way absolutely exactly it'll look different for me than you but that's also what makes it unique right it makes it personal for us and that is the key in a general way of our intrinsic motivation which leads us to that resilience perseverance well-being our kindness to ourselves. There's just so many advantages. It's so powerful to build our foundations, to be the captain of our own life, as we then are more able to successfully, effectively, if you will, connect with others, right? People with strong foundations have much deeper relationships with other people. Absolutely. Anyways, I, we could go on, but I so yeah. appreciate it. It's been a pleasure to no, be here. No, absolutely. It's nice to meet all of you. Yeah, yeah. thank you for um, coming. His website will be in the link uh, for the listeners. And, and I also, I'm going to put it on the screen, like as he, he mentioned this, so you guys should see it. Uh, David, again, thank you for your time and thank you for sharing all that information with us. It was pretty beneficial and interesting. Um, interesting. And yeah, uh, I'll be sure to check out uh, your website and the book because um, it all sounds pretty beneficial. Um, and yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thank you yes, very thank much. You. you guys take thank care. Thank you for coming on. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.